Hello, everyone, and um, let's get started. So my name is Ryan Huang, and I'm a system professor at Johns Hopkins University. So today I will present um, something that my research group has been working on in the past few years um, on runtime checkers in distributed systems and how to generate them. So for any large systems, uh, no matter how thorough you test it, uh, it is inevitable to experience some failures um, when you deploy to production. And due to software bugs, hardware glitches, or misconfigurations. So a constant question that we need to keep asking is, uh, is the system right now running properly? And we rely on a runtime checker to tell us the answer. So just to provide some background, a runtime checker, also called a, a detector or monitor, is deployed together with the target system. And some checker is designed to uh, reside within a system, um, while others are designed more as an external agent. But in either style, it evaluates if um, some expected properties are met. And when the checker finds something is unexpected, it emits um, some alerts and optionally takes some actions. So there are a couple of reasons why um, runtime checkers are important. Um, one is that it is very hard, it is, if not impossible, to find all the bugs statically. And compared to testing, runtime checker is exposed to the exactly the same execution environment um, rather than some simulated testing environment, um, which always have some gaps with the production setup. And in addition, compared to um, postmodern solutions, a checker executes on the scene, so it can find the issue quickly and react. So for these reasons, a runtime checker is a fundamental building block for designing fault-tolerant distributed systems. So in terms of the checking uh, kind of practices, um, there are a couple of widely used mechanisms for runtime checking, um, such as heartbeats, leases, um, periodical file checks. So these solutions typically treat uh, each system component as some black boxes nodes and then assume that each node is either up running well or down. And these practices are, are really influenced by the way that we build a distributed system, and in which we typically abstract away the messy code into some uniform processes, and then model their assorted interactions as some clean messages. But if we really look at um, each process in a large distrib distributed system, we can know that um, modern software is much more than just sending or receiving messages. So each process could have more than one, uh, 200 live threads, and they handle different kinds of requests and run various background tasks. And each of them could experience some issues. And as a result, it is quite common for production distributed system to exhibit not just a simple black or white failures, but uh, oftentimes gray failures. And in those cases, some system component may appear to be working, but it is in fact broken. And as recent studies have shown, um, these failures occur across both software and hardware stacks. And they have very subtle symptoms and, and diverse root causes. I think for this audience, you, are, you probably already have um, quite some first-hand experiences on this topic. But just to give you a concrete example, uh, in a production zookeeper cluster, so Zookeeper is a replicated um, service for distributed coordination. And the leader periodically send heartbeat messages to the followers for failure detection. And in this case, um, the clients that use Zookeeper are experiencing uh, many um, create or update errors, um, but the reads can still succeed. And also interestingly, the leader in this case was um, still ex exchanging heartbeat messages with the followers. As a result, this problematic leader remained the leader and no, no re-election was triggered. And the, when the engineer um, checked the log to see what's going on, um, there was nothing really suspicious. And the resource usage of those, um, this setup is also quite normal. And if, he, uh, if the um, developer used the Zookeeper's own admin API, are you OK to query this leader, he replied, I'm OK. So uh, what, was, what is happening here? In this case, um, a serializer thread inside the leader process got stuck when dumping a snapshot to another instance due to a complex network error. 
However, this serializer still holds a lock to the data tree, which in turn blocks the request processor module. And since the failure detector is not affected, it still keeps sending heartbeat messages to the other processes. So this pr process still appears to be working. So such kind of failure is not really uh, a corner case, but widely exists in, in production systems. So to achieve high availability, um, we need um, runtime, powerful runtime checkers that can cover um, various kinds of gray failure like this previous example. And besides completeness, these checkers should ensure that the detection is accurate and timely and incurs small overhead and requires low overhead, uh, low, low efforts. And achieving all of those properties together is challenging. And we might rely on developers to manually write those checkers, but uh, keep in mind that writing high quality runtime checker is a very time consuming process. And those checkers are typically ad hoc and error prone. And developers have to keep um, repeating those efforts whenever the code changes. So we need tooling support for runtime checkers, but such kind of support is um, very lacking today. So in this talk, um, I will present three solutions um, that aim to generate runtime checkers. And these solutions divide the problem of gray failure into three subcategories and then attack them one by one. So let's start with this um, first approach. And this solution is motivated by the finding that um, although gray failures in general are ambiguous and subtle, many of them are still observable to some components in the system. So take the earlier zookeeper gray failure as an example. So even though the built-in detector did not catch the failure, um, the Cassandra component that uses zookeeper as a lock service uh, actually encounters many lock timeouts. Also, if the follower at this time requested a snapshot from the leader, it will encounter exceptions as well. So if we can leverage those evidences, um, there's a chance to detect this problem. And traditionally, we, we rely on a few um, special controllers, such as some manager or failure detectors to measure some proxy signals, um, like heartbeats. But our insight is that um, we really should also detect what those requesters are seeing. So based on this insight, um, we propose a new approach to failure detection um, by allowing any component in a large system to participate and act as an in-situ observer, meaning that during their normal execution, um, we gather evidences uh, about other components. And the challenge here is um, because of modularity principle, a component may not have really have the incentives to report errors about other components. So indeed, if we look at this uh, related piece of code in the Zookeeper follower that did observe the failure, um, we can see that it has a lot of error handling code, um, but those errors are not really reported elsewhere. So to avoid rewriting those requesters code, we need some automated methods to capture evidences from this existing code. And um, we designed a framework called Panorama to um, realize this approach. So at a high level, um, Panorama works in two stages. In this offline stage, it analyzes and instruments a program um, to convert it into an observer. And then at the runtime stage, um, when this instrumented component interacts with some other components in the system, it may trigger those um, instrumented hooks and then report those observations. And then the framework has a centralized service um, that gather these observations and propagate and exchange them with um, other sources. So for this offline stage, um, the goal here is we want to be able to find some instruction in a program that can provide error evidence about other programs. And typically, such kind of instructions are um, scattered around a, a large source code base, uh, code base. So we use a three-step um, program analysis to systematically identify such kind of instructions. And in the first step, um, we're going to locate what code in a, uh, in a program crosses these component boundaries. And then we um, extract the identifiers of those observer and this monitor subject. And in the last step, we find 
um, what code in this program is influenced by this kind of boundary crossing code? So for this first step, this observation boundary, um, we basically just need to find function invocations that span across components. And these are usually done with standard methods like um, socket IOs or RPCs. And most of the system typically just to use a small set of such interfaces so we can interpose them on them without much effort. And then the observer's identity uh, is obtained from a one-time registration when the system starts. Um, but the identity of this monitored subject can be found from this um, boundary object that we identify. And once you find this boundary, uh, the analyzer will uh, further locate those error handlers in the code that are influenced by the boundary, and then insert the hooks there to report evidence. And in addition, some of this error evidence may be some unexpected reply. So the analyzer runs some uh, entry procedure analysis to look for errors that have some control dependencies on those reply objects. And to give you a concrete example, um, let's look at this piece of code from, from Zookeeper. So in this case, the tool will first locate the read record call um, as an ob observation boundary um, because it's a remote message invocation to another component B. And then based on this input archive instance, we can extract this identity of the monitored subject. And now we can perform control and data flow analysis to further extract the observations. In particular, we can see that from this line, uh, the line three is checking the sanity of the reply object, um, this node um, variable, and complain that the data tree is somehow invalid. So in, this indicates that component B may have some issues. In addition, we can, look, uh, we can see that there's another control flow at line 14 that's through an I.O. exception. This program point indicates that this component A fails to get a reply from this component B. So in the end, this line 5 and line 14 are the places that we can instrument the hooks to report those evidences. So now, given this approach, we applied our tool um, for um, large-scale distributed systems, um, including HDFS and Zookeeper. And we reproduced uh, 15 real-world grade failure cases in those systems. And the overall result is that um, Panorama can detect all of those uh, 15 failures in under um, seven seconds. But in comparison, the built-in detectors can only detect one case in around five minutes. And this graph shows the timeline of um, what happens in this first failure case. And we can see that the Panorama observers start to report fa uh, failures soon after the failure occurs, and then stops reporting when the failure clears. And this lower graph um, also shows the client's latency and errors. And we can see that the Panorama's reporting closely matched the client's experience. And note that here that you might um, see the client's view is actually noisy. This is because it's executing some mixed workloads. Now, performance-wise, the main overhead um, perceived by those observers is uh, really the report async API calls, and which takes less than one microsecond. We also measure the um, overall end-to-end -end latency impact to those observers, and the average latency overhead is below 3%. And we can achieve this low overhead because most of the reporting only occurs when there is some errors are happening in the system. So now um, the Panorama's approach actually relies on some um, other witnesses in a large system to participate and detect complex failures. Um, we, we take a step back and then explore um, how can we enhance a component's self-checking ability. So to answer this question, um, we look at the code of um, some existing detectors, and we find that a common problem among those detectors is that their checking logic is actually disjoint with the uh, program's logic. So they, they, they cannot really accurately reflect the main program status. So we can summarize this lesson as an intersection principle. That is, if you want to design an effective detector, um, it, it should ensure its checking logic intersects with the monitored programs. So based on this principle, um, we propose a software watchdog abstraction. And, and that has um, a, a number of mimic style checkers. And those checkers basically imitate the main program by executing some similar operations. 
And these watchdogs are really customized to each given system so that they um, inspect different modules of the system and report issues specific to that module. And to help um, developers construct such kind of a mimic uh, watchdogs, we designed a tool called Omega Gen. So Omega Gen will analyze the source code of a given program and then generate this kind of customized watchdogs and instruments and package the watchdog back into the original program. And the core technique that we use behind the tool is um, program reduction. So the goal of this technique is basically to create a reduced version of a given program in P in a way that still allow this uh, reduced version to ex uh, expose some issue that um, P may have, but without imposing on P's execution. So you might wonder why do we want to do um, reduction here? So an alternative option is um, let's just invoke some high level functions of the main program inside a checker and which will execute all the code in these functions in the checker. So although such a checker may expose issues, this code region um, can be too large to really narrow down where the problem is. Another reason that uh, we might want to do reduction is because continuously checking everything at runtime incurs unnecessary costs. And if you look at those, this, um, this piece of code, many operations correctness we can see is actually logically deterministic, um, like converting a string, sorting an array, or, or appending a pass. So th um, those operations are usually well tested offline already. While it's certainly possible that they can still be buggy, uh, if we continuously monitor them at runtime in a watchdog, it will likely yield uh, diminishing returns. And given the limited runtime checking resources, we should prioritize checking um, some other operations. So with that in mind, um, the workflow of the tool involves um, five major steps, uh, which I will briefly describe in the following slides. So in the first step, um, a target system can have a very large code base. Um, but oftentimes, we really only care about uh, the parts that, that may execute continuously. And to identify such kind of long-running code region, um, the tool traverses each, code, uh, each node in the program call graph. And then for each node, it defines the potential long-running loops and recursive color of those invoked methods. And besides loops, it also supports um, periodical tasks like um, executors. So this step will output a list of entry functions that may be potentially um, long-running. And one of the challenges here is that um, a method may have multiple call sites, and only some of the call sites will make this method long-running uh, at runtime. And to address this challenge, um, we use a predicate-based um, algorithm that can activate and deactivate the watchdogs based on the call side predicates. So once we select a list of um, entry methods that we want to reduce, um, the, the two next uh, will we'll try to select the checking target candidates. And this selection step is necessary because a watchdog cannot really afford to check all the operations. At the runtime mechanism, the watchdogs focus on reporting um, some op checking operation that may potentially exhibit some unique issues in a production setup. So we call this operation some vulnerable operations. Uh, in this case, for example, this write record operation actually depends on the disk and the storage stack, the network, and scheduling in a particular production setup. So including this kind of operation in a watchdog can likely expose some interesting issues. So Omega Gen uses a simple heuristic-based method to infer how vulnerable an operation is. And the default heuristics include I.O. synchronization, communication. And we also support some um, user-defined criteria uh, by using the, this vulnerable annotation. And once we we've have this identified long-running methods, um, Omega Gen performs a, a top-down reduction from this entry point of each long-running method. So in this example, uh, it reduces this take snapshot, which is executed inside this while loop. And then when walking this control flow graph of the function, 
it checks if an instruction is vulnerable based on the previous criteria, and then keeps the instruction if so. Otherwise, this instruction is discarded. And but for a call instruction that is not determined just yet, uh, such as this dt.serialize call in this example, um, it will be temporarily retained, and Omega Gen will recursively reduce the call list. So we will reduce this serialized function and this serialized node function. And then finally, we find this write record operation there to keep. So afterwards, um, we may have some vulnerable operation that's repeatedly uh, occurring in the code, and we will also reduce them. And during this process, uh, the main program structure is actually preserved in the reduced watchdogs. So this structure later on can help you um, localize where the issue is when the watchdog um, generates some alerts. So once all the entry methods are, are reduced, um, Omega Gen encapsulates those non-empty ones into the watchdog checkers. And since these code snippets may be incomplete because of missing definitions, the tools analyzes um, the variables that are needed in a reduced method and, and add proper uh, definition there. It then generates a context factory to manage those arguments for those checkers. And finally, it adds some basic safety and liveness check in the watchdog driver uh, to catch the failure signals at runtime. And this right figure showed the, uh, an example of this encapsulated checker from the reduced uh, code snippets. But checkers at this point still cannot um, directly execute because of uh, missing payloads. So at this point, Omega Gen will instrument some context setters in the pro main program. So the idea is that this context setter can then supply those context objects to the checkers at runtime. And then the checker side will invoke the corresponding getters to ensure the context is ready uh, before execution. So now we can execute those watchdog checkers. Um, but one thing that we need to be careful is that the watchdog may accidentally modify the main program um, states if some operation may produce side effects. And to prevent this kind of side effect, um, the Omega Gen analyzes what are the objects that are referenced in the checker and then ensure that the context, um, uh, context factory can uh, replicate those objects. So any uh, modification will be only affecting those replicated objects while the original main program uh, states are intact. And we also designed some optimization like lazy replication to avoid some unnecessary um, replication um, and the overhead. So for evaluation, we applied Omega Gen on six large uh, distributed systems. And as shown in the table, our tool can actually generate um, hundreds of watchdogs for these systems. And the bottom figure showed the coverage ratio of watchdogs at the thread level granularity for each system. And the average coverage ratio for this system is around 60%. Now to further evaluate how effective those generated watchdogs are, uh, we reproduced 22 real-world uh, failures from six distributed systems. And then for comparison, we implemented four types of advanced checkers. Um, the client detector is the panorama that uh, in, in the first part of the talk. And then we also have implemented the probe checker and the signal check and resource checkers, which are the common practices for detecting complex failures. Now, overall, the um, watchdog can actually detect 20 out of the 22 failures and with a median detection time of around 4.2 seconds. And in general, the watchdogs are effective for um, catching liveness issues like some indefinite blocking operations and safety issues that trigger explicit error signals. But they are less effective for some silent correctness errors. And for the baselines, even the combination of all those baseline checkers can only detect 14 failures. So since the watchdog as well as the other solutions are um, ineffective to deal with this kind of uh, silent failures, um, in, in the last part of this uh, talk, uh, we're going to focus on this uh, tackle this problem of silent failures, which is the most challenging subcategory of uh, gray failures. So distributed system today provides um, many um, um, semantics, such as exactly once message delivery, um, your created data should be persisted in, in redundant copies, 
And whenever some object is updated, some virtues should be invoked. But bugs in, in those uh, distributed systems can break those semantics without causing any explicit error signals. For example, you may have some messages that get delivered twice, or some data may not get replicated to the enough copies. And when some object is updated, the, uh, the system may fail to notify the client. And such kind of silent violations can cause severe consequences, but they are extremely difficult to detect uh, because of lack of any error signals. So to get some insights into this class of failures, um, we did a study on 109 real-world silent semantic failures from nine distributed systems. And we made a number of um, interesting findings. So for example, we find that although these systems keep adding new features um, with new semantics over the years, um, the majority of the sampled failures are actually violent semantics that has existed since a very stable release of the system. So for example, the Zookeeper Ephemer node semantics is introduced in 2008, but 14 years later, there are still bugs violating these semantics. This may sound like the developers of this system do not really write enough tests, um, but that's not really the case. In fact, uh, more than 70% of those violated semantics are actually covered by some existing tests. So what are the gaps then? Um, we observe that oftentimes, although developers add regression tests, those regression tests um, typically only check if the root cause of a specific uh, failure is fixed, rather than checking the underlying semantics itself. So as a result, those regression tests cannot really catch violation of the same semantics and their different root cause. So based on this insight, um, we designed a tool called OSKeeper. Um, and the key idea of this tool is to uh, extract the underlying semantic essence of some existing regression test uh, for this past uh, semantic failure. And this essence is really just some semantic rules. And then we can enforce those uh, semantic rules at runtime to continue to check for new violations. But one question is, how can we really express some semantics of a distributed system? Um, existing solutions typically express system properties um, as some predicates over some key state variables, and then check if those state relationships uh, hold in some global snapshot. But the semantics and the violation that we target uh, are related to system features and are much broader, and they cannot really be simply expressed as some um, state relations. And OSKeeper instead focuses on those um, really semantics related events, such as invocation of some operations and update to some states. And it is interest in uh, this relationship among those events such as some state update events always imply another state update event. And then the workflow of the, the two OSKeeper consists of two phases. In the pre-production phase, it infers those semantic rules from past semantic um, failure regression tests. And this is done by instrumenting the target system and running both the buggy version and the pasture version to emit two set of traces. And the inference engine then automatically extracts highly relevant semantic rules from these two traces. And in the runtime phase, um, OSKeeper will continuously check if the, uh, check the system traces against these um, uh, inferred semantic rules to find potential violations. So to emit these um, semantic event traces, uh, OSKeeper automatically instruments both the uh, buggy and patched systems and to then exercise this system with the regression test to generate the event traces. So here's a subset of the traces from the ephemeral node uh, test from Zookeeper. So it, you can see it involves some key events such as update to the ephemeral nodes variable and the session list and invocation of the serialized operation during snapshot. And we mark those events as E1, E2, and E3. And here our goal is to infer the relations among those events. And to efficiently infer the rules among um, these collected events, we take a template-driven approach and define a set of uh, general rule templates, such as happens before relationship and atomicity. 
and each template is parameterized. So during the inference step, um, OSKeeper will iterate through all the uh, iterates through all the templates and then enumerates the potential instances for each template. So here we show an uh, example of the inference step um, for this template P implies Q, um, which implies every event P, um, for every event P, there is a subsequent event Q. And we can apply the template to uh, a patch the trace. And inferring of this template uses a simple counting approach. In the first step, um, we um, initialize the occurrence counter for every possible event pairs, and all those counters are initialized to zero. And then the second step iterates through the, trace, the events in the trace, and if it finds the left operators, the counter is incremented, and if it finds the right operator and the counter is positive, we decrement the counter. And in the end, if the counter equals zero, the relation uh, holds. And in this example, it uh, outputs three rules after the inference uh, steps. So after obtaining this initial inferred rules, we then validate these rules against the buggy trace. And the reason that we do this is because um, only, if, um, only the rules that fail those buggy trace are those ones that are highly relevant to the particular violet semantics. So similarly for this validation, we scan the trace and update the counters. And at, at the end of this step, we preserve two rules that are relevant. But there could be still a number of false rules. And to further reduce, um, to further reduce them, the verifiers validate the rules against the traces from all test cases, and then discard the rules that failed in some tests. So eventually we can get uh, both relevant and validated rules. And then the final rule that we get from this previous small subset is that the update to the data tree.infirmer node um, imply the updates to the session tracker dot, uh, session by ID. Now we have integrated um, OSKeeper with uh, Zookeeper, HDFS, and Kafka. And because the tool requires some old failures and associated regression tests to extract those kind of semantic rules, we select several tests from this each system which cover the major functionality of these systems. And in total, given those tests, OSKeeper extracted 1,600 rules for these systems. To evaluate whether these uh, inferred rules are useful to catch new violations, uh, we reproduced seven new bugs reported by developers. And these bugs violate uh, related semantics in the old cases, but with uh, very different root causes. And with inferred rules, OSKeeper can detect violation for six of them. And in com comparison, the state of our checker can only detect one of those violations here. We also measure the overhead OSKeeper introduces to the system at a runtime. And then the main source of the overhead come from the added instrumentation to emit the traces at runtime. And the average system throughput is around 1.27%. Uh, and this low overhead is enabled by some um, optimization that we introduce, such as ring buffer optimization. So in conclusion, production distributed systems today often exhibit a complex misbehavior, and which really require high quality runtime checkers. But manually writing such kind of a checker is difficult. And this talk gives an, a survey of three approaches of tooling support to generate runtime checker uh, that include in situ observers, um, program reduction, and semantic rule inferences. And quite some detail of those solutions are left out due to time constraints, but I'd be happy to chat offline and send you the papers if you're interested in knowing more about the details. And, and with that, thank you for your attention, and I think I can take questions. Yeah, that's a good question. So for each of the two, um, in the three tool, we actually have some mechanism to ensure to reduce a false positive. So for the first one, the in situ observer, uh, the main source that you can have um, some false positive is because some noisy observer, like they have their own problem, like their own network has some issues. So for that, we have uh, design and algorithm that's tolerant, uh, basically using some majority voting mechanism. So once we introduce that algorithm, the false positive rate is very low, it's below 1%. For the second, the watchdog one, um, 
the, the false positive can come from you are executing some operation that is locally having some impact, but globally they may not have any impact. So to, uh, to address that kind of false positive, we design some validator mechanism and that's not mentioned in this, um, in this talk, but essentially the idea is whenever the watchdog, uh, the checker triggers, you want to invoke another validator that further check whether there's some end-to-end -end impact. And if so, um, you, um, you, can, you, can, you have some confidence that there's really an issue. So once you add that um, validator, again, the, the false positive rate is like um, around one to 2%. For the last one, uh, the, the semantic rule inference, the false positive really depends on the quality of your underlying test. So if your test overall, like it's not very comprehensive, you can certainly infer some false rules. So for that, you want to typically want to make sure that before you deploy those inferred rules, maybe take a look at those inferred rules, and then that can give you high confidence. So we measure the false positive really varies. So some systems only have like 4%, and some systems have like 9%. Um, because sometimes you, you're not really confident that you may generate some rule that are false. Yeah, yeah so, so your question is asking how do we apply those changes in the Panorama's uh, tool, right? In the first tool, right? Yeah, so uh, actually in the original approach we took is uh, more of like a seamless integration, which is just a parsing, um, passively parsing those logs from each component. And we need to write some adapters. But it turns out these uh, adapters are like, um, because logging practice across different components vary a lot, and it's sometimes you really don't even have the information in your log, like what are the components that you are interacting with. So we tried, like with Zookeeper, it is fine, but then when we extend to other system, it's very fragile, and when, when, when you, for example, apply to a new version of the system, those log adapters, you need to really keep updating them. So uh, that's why later on we switched to just directly using static an, uh, analysis tool. Uh, for this Java system, we use a tool called a Suit. So this tool can allow you to um, do the analysis and directly instrument the Java program, and then you can just parse that instrument uh, version as, an, as another jar file. So then you can just deploy that jar file. So that will already include all those uh, reporting hooks. Yeah, so, so, yes, um, so I think maybe the question is, like for those operations that you don't include in your watchdog, uh, do you have some confidence about like how safe they are, do, or do you have even have some strong proof about maybe they will never cause issue? Uh, for us, we don't really have that kind of strong guarantee. Uh, I think for, for selecting whether some operation is really vulnerable or not really kind of is um, um, heuristic based in, in our kind of scenario, you can of course have like even your, for example, array sorting algorithm could have some bugs and that only man manifest for certain production workload that you won't see in your, in your kind of uh, uh, offline testing, right? So, um, I think in the end, it kind of really boils down to how much budget that you have uh, for your runtime checking resource. So if you have a red like maybe five to 10%, you can maybe include a few more, especially like one metric that you can, maybe you don't have really like proof kind of uh, guarantee. Maybe you can use something like your testing coverage for those code that you don't really have a lot of uh, strong, uh, of, uh, good coverage, you can maybe consider including them. And then if it turns out like uh, they, they don't really have, incur a lot of runtime overhead, and that's great, maybe you can still keep them, but if you actually turn out it, keep checking them, really uh, incur a lot of overhead, and then in the end, uh, you don't really see a lot of kind of uh, um, false um, uh, alerts from those issues, maybe you should execute them. It's kind of a iterative process you can refine and then see uh, at, like, uh, like, like from your, your deployment. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. So for the watchdogs approach, um, we, we, we mentioned that we uh, replicate objects to provide this kind of memory isolation so that no matter what kind of operation you invoke in your watchdog checkers, you won't affect the main program. What about external calls or some like IO um, related events? So for those, we actually have something like called idempotent wrappers so that um, the, the system, you still need to really identify like what are some operations that are external that like are IO related. And once you can identify them, the checkers, uh, the, the tool will generate an idempotent wrapper so that when, when the checker invokes them, it won't actually do the, do the invocation. You will let the main program do it. And then the main program may left out some data but that's cached and then you can use it in your checker. So it's a little bit complicated but we, we do have some mechanisms there to, to handle this situation. Yeah, in general, I.O. and external calls are more difficult to handle for, for watchdogs. Yeah. yeah, I think if 
no question, and that's that's all. And, and if you have other, if you want to know more, some, more about this detail, I'm happy to chat offline. Thank you all.